Welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I'm, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 144th episode, our returning guest is Leon Nafok. You first heard Leon on episode 101 and episode 121 of the podcast. Leon Nafok is the co-creator of the Fiasco podcast and the president of Prologue Projects, a small podcast studio in Brooklyn. Previously, he hosted and co-produced Slow Burn at Slate. Nafok started his career in print journalism, writing for the New York Observer, the Boston Globe, and Slate. He is the author of The Next Next Level, a story of rap, friendship, and almost giving up. And now on to the show. Yeah, thanks for coming back. I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, congratulations. I really enjoyed it. Uh, last two, last two, last two uh, interviews you did. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it was fun. Um, but uh, congratulations on Fiasco. I'm really enjoying it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's uh, it's just as engrossing as any of your you know previous uh, seasons of Slow Burn, and uh, you've you've really picked uh, some rich territory uh, to which to explore. I think. So well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's definitely uh, it's definitely uh, like a very different uh, story uh, than the than the first two things I did uh, that Andrew and I did. It's like it's. Uh, it's a different. Well, we'll, we'll talk about it, but it's, it's it is it, it feels like a different uh, material from which to make something. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, I uh, I wasn't done listening to Slow Burn when we talked last because it wasn't out yet, but now I have heard it all, um, and uh, it was very good as well. But uh, what is what if anything is happening with Slow Burn now? Because that is that is not something you're doing anymore. <laughs> Uh, that's right. Uh, so Slate is continuing on with Slow Burn. Um, they're making a new season uh, with a new host. Um, and uh, it was announced recently that they're doing uh, the murders of Biggie and Tupac. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. Now you're on to your own company now, which is called Prologue Projects, right? Yeah. Uh, well, so it's sort of like, it happened like, uh, somewhat simultaneously with the Luminary stuff. Um, basically, when I was at Slate uh, and Slow Burn was sort of taking off, we started getting interest from uh, like TV people uh, about the rights to Slow Burn, and so and I didn't really know how to deal with it. So I I asked around, you know, I asked my friends like if they knew anyone who could help me with it, um, and I ended up hiring a manager. Um, who sort of helped me negotiate that whole situation. Um, and then um, my manager uh, sort of kind of guided me towards, uh, you know, th- this idea of starting my own um, operation, you know, where, where, where I would own, you know, the work that I was making and, um, you know, I could be sort of more like in control of my destiny, which is the word that, he and other Hollywood people love to use. You want to be in control of your own destiny. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so, you know, the luminary thing came along and it was just an opportunity to basically like create, you know, a show at a level of, of, of quality that, um, that I wanted to make um, with a, with a level of staffing and resources that, that I thought it needed. Um, And it gave me the opportunity to, you know, start, start a, small studio that for now is just, you know, we, 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 we mostly work on fiasco and we, we also produce the Trevor Noah show for, for luminary. Um, but in the future, you know, hopefully we'll be doing, uh, we'll be doing other, other shows as well that are more in the narrative mold. Very cool. Yeah. I think there's a lot of potential there and, you know, you've definitely shown that you can do the work. So I don't think that's a problem at all. Um, and you know, your, your, uh, your work speaks for itself because I, I think that like, there's, there's gotta be so much leftover material that you can't use from anything you're researching like this. There's just, there's just so much on the cutting floor. And, uh, you know, it, uh, I know at Slate, you had the extra bonus Slate Plus episodes and I noticed you, I haven't listened to this one yet, but you did also just have an extra interview that you just dropped on this one as well. Yeah. We um, sort, of, sort of put out like a, a little inter- interlude in between mm-hmm first half and second half of the season right but why do you uh one thing i wanted to ask about your structure is why do you limit yourself to a certain number of episodes Um, is that like for reasons of cost or scale or i mean i know it's got to be hard to produce that much good content but like there's got to be more to say than that like i just feel like there's even with everything you said and i i really enjoy it it's like i feel like this could be twice as long and i would be just as interested you know (laughs) 
So, I mean, there's a couple, there's a couple of things that go into that. Um, you know, one, one, one sort of, I guess, thing to say up top is that, you know, we, we really plot these things out in advance. Um, sure. So, like, even though we're, we're currently still working on the final two episodes, they haven't been, you know, we still have three episodes to release. Uh, we're still working on five and six. Um, we're almost done, but we're still working on them. You know, part of the, um, you know, part, part of the reason that's possible is that we, 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 we've known what's going to be in those episodes, you know, since the beginning. Um, you know, our first sort of phase of working on a season is like figuring out what the structure of it's going to be. Like, what are we going to talk about in each of these episodes? That's true. And, and, you know, all the, all the reporting we do during the first like couple months of the process, um, is geared towards like figuring out who, who we need to talk to, um, for, for individual episodes. Um, and so, I mean, that's just, that's like a reason to, to, to set an A number, you know, it's not a, it, that doesn't determine what number it is, whether it's six mm-hmm. or eight or 12, um, you know, I'll be honest, like with, with Watergate, we totally just picked eight kind of at random, I think. Um, <laughs> I'm not really sure I did the outline before I picked eight. I think we picked eight and then I did the outline. Um, and then with Clinton, I think we just thought, yeah, eight seemed like the right amount of material. And, so, <laughs> and, 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 and then season two turned out to be a lot longer than season one, just in terms of like runtime, like the episodes were longer. Um, mm-hmm. And so for this one, we decided to do six um, in part because we felt like you know, it's 36 days, you know, how much can there be to say? Um, which is a very naive, uh, naive thought. Um, and we, we found is, you know, doing six episodes, like each episode is like almost an hour, um, which, you know, we, which is not something like we take pride in. Like, I think brevity is, is, is preferable. Uh, I wish they were shorter, but, um, it's just a lot of plot to, uh, to cover it turns out. And so, mm-hmm. you know, is it possible that like doing eight episodes, that would have been shorter, uh, would have been better than six. Yeah, maybe. Um, but I think you sort of got to just set your, set your marks at the top and, and sort of hope for the best. And, you know, it, it's, it's hard at the level of our, um, at the level of like sort of precision with which we're trying to like plot out these episodes. Um, it's hard to sort of call an audible like halfway through, you know, and say, actually, we, you know, we want to do more episodes, you know? True. But I mean, you also get, uh, guests, maybe that you didn't think you'd get i'm sure and you know you get you talked to not to spoil anything but you have talked to katherine harris which was pretty interesting yeah um you know how was that to interview someone that was so uh you know caricatured i guess like you played the saturday night live Mm -hmm. and john stewart and david letterman making fun of her appearance and uh yeah like she's a pretty reviled character. I mean, obviously that's happened to you before in interviewing, but like, like you don't know necessarily, or do you know that you're going to get Catherine Harris at the beginning? And because it seems like sometimes you get things at the last minute, maybe. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I'll say this: like with 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 this season, because so much of it uh, took place in Florida, we knew that we were going to try to talk to a lot of people in Florida, and so mm-hmm. for a while we like we were like, all right, we know we're going to Florida for you know probably like two weeks or ten days. Mm-hmm. Or and we don't know exactly when, but like, let's start putting out feelers, people we know we want to talk to. Let's like see when they're available. Let's see if we can like triangulate all these different people. And what we ended up doing was, you know, we had a whiteboard up on our, on our wall. And, you know, once we like kind of landed on the dates that we were going to go, me and Andrew, uh, my, you know, our, our uh, executive producer, um, we went down there together to do all these interviews. And so we, I think, I can't remember how many we scheduled while we were down there, but I think it was like 30 like mm. 35 or something it was really yeah. fucking back to back just like you know we just didn't wow. stop the time we were there um and so Catherine harris just like we got lucky like she was available during the time we were there and you know i remember we were originally plat- plotting the you know the trip um we were just like, talking about you know because there's all these different places you can go right you can go to you can go to miami you can go to palm beach you can go to fort lauderdale um you know and so we, we, we weren't really sure, like, we were going to go to Sarasota. But then um, when she came through and said, you know, yeah, I can, I can do the interview, but, you know, you got to come to me. We just, like, adjusted our, our plans and made sure that we, were, we could be where she could talk to us. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, that was a really interesting interview because she actually called you out on the name of your show. Yeah. That was her. Yeah. That was... <laughs> she, she doesn't even uh, go with the conceit that it was a fiasco. That's right. Um, yeah, it's funny with the name of the show. Like, I, I really like the name of the show. I think it's like really catchy and memorable. Um, uh, Madeline Kaplan, our, our producer who 
came up with it. Um, but I, I didn't think about how, like, I, until I literally sat down at my desk, like, on my first day to, like, send my first, like, couple emails, you know, asking for people for interviews about the election. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about it until that moment that, um, shit, like, I'm going to be emailing all these people and saying, hey, I want to talk to you about this thing you were involved in. And by the way, my show is called Fiasco. Uh, <laughs> I just, like, didn't think about it. I just didn't think about it. And it's too bad because, actually, I don't think that... <laughs> we will want to cover in the future is going to be like easily caricature characterized as a fiasco you know like there's ideas we have for, for seasons that i'm like uh, well you know if i were them like i wouldn't want to be i would want to like participate in a in a show that was called that um and so i'm i'm, I'm wondering you know i i hope that like i hope that like the way this season um I hope the way if people hear this, you know, when people, if people who like are considering going on our show in the future, I hope that if they hear this season, they'll be able to tell that like what we do is very even handed and, um, totally, what totally. We're, what we're trying to do is like not blame anyone, you know, in particular, but just kind of just like explain where everybody's coming from, uh, and why they did the things they yeah. did. Um, which is not to say well, that absolutely. like, what, you know, yeah. Well, as a, as a listener, I, I definitely get that sense. And, and I even sometimes I'm like, you're being like too fair to this person that doesn't even deserve it. Like, I think you're almost like too much that way sometimes. So if anything, that's a compliment. You know what I mean? Because it's like you're not <laughs> you're not taking it the other direction. But like, you know, there are certain people that I'm like, oh, come on, this person is ridiculous. Like you, you can't give this much, much leeway. But like you're you're relentlessly fair in that way, because I have strong feelings about some of the people that you interview. So. <laughs> did you think that about the Catherine Harris interview? What about it? Did you think that about the Catherine Harris interview? Um, I still don't think that she was right for everything she did. So I, I, I disliked her less than I've... Uh, well, I'll just say it. I, I still don't see Linda Tripp's point. <laughs> you know, um, just to, to not to put a too fine a point on it. I, I, I don't think that she had to do that. Uh, and I don't think that she was acting as uh, motherly as she thinks she was or she convinced herself that she did. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. But like someone like that, I have strong feelings about. But you go out of your way to, you know, hear them out and hear these people that were, you know, reviled or, you know, uh, infamous in the media for a certain amount of time. I mean, John Goodman played her. How, that's that's got a sting. <laughs> you know? um, who yeah. I love John. I love John Goodman. But still, I mean, that's, you know, I think I think they're like. I think there's a, I think there's like an expectation. Maybe you see this a lot with like magazine journalism where people are, read some readers for some reason expect you to like at the end of like a quote, you know, you quote someone saying something or you describe them doing something and people will expect you to be like, and I think that's bad. Yeah. Or, right. Or I, I disapprove of that by the way, just so you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, you yeah, don't, you, you, don't, you don't need to put that in. Like, no, you don't. And it's like people off people often like will read a profile of someone who they think of as a villain and they'll read the profile and they'll be like, I can't believe the New York Times like didn't call this person out on this, this, and this. And it's like, yo, you know about this, this, and this because you read it in the story. Like, and the person put those things in for a reason. Uh, the reporter put those things in for a reason. You know what I mean? And so like I think there's there's a way to be like even handed but still a point of view, you know, like you're still making choices about what you're putting in front of people. And you're, you know, the, the job I think is not to be like, to not have a point of view is to it's to it's to be unbiased in the sense of like not um, not being untruthful, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, in the service of, of kind of helping one side or the other look better, you know. Absolutely, yeah, for sure. Um, now going back to the like, you know, I talked about John Stewart and David Letterman saying some pretty outrageous things, you know, in, in your slow burn, you had, of course, Bill Maher saying some pretty gross things about Monica Lewinsky and yeah. other people that it was, it was just okay to say at the time. Um, what have you found going back to, uh, the original audios that you've heard? Cause you do use a lot of primary source material, which has got to be fascinating to pour through, I'm sure. Definitely. Um, yeah, big, big, big shout out to my team of, 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 of amazing producers who, who've done like the, the lion's share of, of the, of the archive digging. I get to be the one who like hears it once they've like found all the good, good mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and then, you know, try to incorporate it into a script. But, um, it's, it's, uh, you know, one thing that was interesting about kind of moving from the seventies to the nineties between Slover and one and two was that with the, with the, with the seventies, like all the tape, all the archival tape is, um, 
just you can just like you can just like hear the 70s you know mm-hmm. it just like sounds like the 70s and with 90s it's like a little more it's like obviously more modern by 20 years uh and it's um it's like not as identifiably in the past um and I think that's sort of that's sort of true here too. Like the year two thousand, like I don't think I don't think it sounds like that different from the way things sound now, um, in terms of just like the texture of the recording, you know. Um, and so you're trying to you're trying right. to find audio that I think that that invokes that sort of is is of the moment in other ways, like in more in more uh, I guess I would say like uh, like like substantive as opposed to um, as opposed to aesthetic, like you know they're, they 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 like maybe they reference someone you know who is not who doesn't get referenced anymore. Maybe they reference someone very like two thousand. Maybe they you know we we had a we had one clip. I think we had to cut it in the end, unfortunately. But like it was a it was a clip of the Macy's Day Parade on Thanksgiving two thousand, um, which took place right as the recount was sort of cresting, and uh, the Baja men were performing "Let the Dogs Out." You know, <laughs> and that's just like it's just a perfect clip because you're like remember like this 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 is this this could not have happened any time other than. <laughs> well, I, that yeah, that brings me to my next point is that I definitely, of course, I remembered, uh, you know, Watergate, not Watergate, I wasn't there for that, but uh, no, Whitewater and, uh, you know, the Malinsky affair or the Clinton affair as you know, uh, in the parlance of our times. Um, but, you know, I definitely was politically aware when this whole fiasco happened as it were you know uh i was slightly too young to vote uh i didn't turn 18 until april of the next year so actually i didn't i just missed it but i was totally aware of it and it was enthralling um you were obviously alive then too how does it feel to go back through something that you were alive for i know we talked about this with the last you know the season of slow burn but like this is so real and you know Really, just like only months before nine eleven, which I definitely remember, of course, and everybody right. does. But yeah, um, so I, like, I don't remember being that invested in it while it was happening. Mm-hmm. I like, remember a conversation with like school, like a teacher at my school, like the day after, being like, oh, like "I just want to know who won," or some like <laughs> some stupid thing like that. Um, and I like, can't remember being invested in it to the point where I was like. Like, I just, like, don't, I don't remember being disappointed that Gore lost. I don't remember being, like, I just don't remember feeling anything about it. Um, doesn't mean I didn't, like, but I just don't remember. Um, hmm. But I will say that, like, and yeah, I think, I think 9-11, like, definitely overshadows it, obviously, in people's, people's memories. Um, I will say that, like, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense of, like, there's always, like, dramatic irony when you're talking about the past, right? Because you know how things are going to turn out while the people who are in the story don't. Um, there's a little more of that here maybe than, than, than there has been with the, you know, in the past, the other two, the other two shows we made um, because it, like, I think at the time in 2000, it felt a little bit like a low stakes election. Um, I think people were just like not, and, and, and some people have told me I'm wrong about this. I can't really tell, but like my impression, very, very non-scientific is that like, people just weren't that invested in this election. Like people didn't really <laughs> either of these guys, like, yeah, no one was just like right. that, you know, no one like really thought it was particularly high stakes. Like part of it was that, you know, they were coming off of like years and years of prosperity and peace. Like there's a sense that just like no one could really fuck it up. And so like, it doesn't really matter maybe who, who gets elected. And then Nader like played into that with young people, like, you know, saying that they were, these guys were kind of the same and you know, their, their similarities are more important than their differences. Um, and so I think like, I think, both knowing that you know Bush's presidency went the way it did, and the decisions were made that were made, and simultaneously like knowing about Al Gore and kind of how much fire he turned out to have in his in his belly for 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 you know global warming activism, it's hard not to wonder. It's hard not to feel like wow, the stakes here were really high. Um, right. You know what I mean? Like we we who knows like how who knows how Al Gore would handle nine eleven? Who knows? You know, Al Gore, as I, I gather, I don't, I'm not an expert on this, but I gather he was quite, quite like pro, you know, going to war, you know, in the name of intervention or, or whatever. Um, not my area of expertise, but like he may, you know, maybe he would have gone into Iraq too. Like, who knows? But um, it just like you realize in retrospect that, man, the stakes were really high. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think that imbues uh, the story with some gravity, just like 
going just like from 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 the jump you know right uh it's been interesting too because i've been listening to this and then just the other night my wife and i watched vice and so that was kind of an uh, interesting juxtaposition to see the <laughs> the Dick Cheney side of it. Um, but yeah, wow, it just it was it, and it's like uh, you know to get into the margins here. Uh, there's so much to talk about that with this, but like it's so few votes, it's insane. It's so so close, and it shouldn't even matter because frankly, the electoral college is ridiculous. And, you know, uh, it will increasingly be as time goes on. I would just love for the Democrats to win the Electoral College and lose the popular vote once and just see what happens to everyone who defends the Electoral College, by the way. <laughs> we, have this, we have this at the end of, um, we have this at the end of episode one, like mm -hmm. going into election day, the like, Gore people were like very worried that Gore would win the <laughs> college and lose the popular vote. And they were like, what are we going to, like, how are we going to defend against, you know, people saying that this is an illegitimate victory? And, like, I don't know, there's something so telling about that, like, that when the Republic, you know, when the Republican Party found itself in that situation, like, there was, there was no way, like, that anyone was going to score a point on them for winning the pop, winning the electoral college and not the popular vote. Like, <laughs> it wasn't going to happen. Like, and, and, but the Democrats, you know, they just, like, they knew they would be vulnerable to to those attacks, and I think they were, they they were right. They would have been. Um, mm -hmm. And part of I think part of me trying to work work through this is this this season is like trying to figure out sort of why that difference is there, um, and trying to describe that difference and sort of capture examples of it. Um, you know, I think like, like insofar as this season has uh, you know a lot of sort of re like modern relevance, like it it is a little bit about like the souls of these two parties and kind of what how they how they um, operate and, and sort of what their value, like what, why they're, like what the sort of logic is, I guess, in, in, in that sort of governs like their, their combat, you know? That makes oh, sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, like, like, like Republicans play to win and Democrats seem like they think they're there to show the Republicans a good example of how to behave or something. Um, and who, who ends up winning, of course, uh, this, this fiasco, uh, the Republicans do and continue to, uh, to this day, really, it's, it's really how they play it, they, The same strategies have played out over and over again. You know, when, you know, when, we, when they go low, we go high and then we, <laughs> and then the Democrats lose inevitably because the Republicans are just their plan to win. They're 51 to 49 is a victory. And sometimes 50, 50 with the tie in the Senate, as long as the vice president breaks the tie, <laughs> you know, oh it'll happen. You know, they just care about getting it across the goal line. And if it looks a little ugly in the end, it's so be it. The win's a win, you know, yeah, I think the Merrick Garland thing is probably like the most, mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting is like, I don't know, like you get why people are reluctant to, you know, to be, I don't know, it's, it's, I guess what, I guess, I guess what I've been sort of trying to figure out is like, why is one side so immune to charges of hypocrisy and so indifferent to them, while the other one seems like to be concerned about them and like to be governed and sort of be compelled by them, like mm -hmm. by, by fears of being accused of hypocrisy, but also like is I think correct in that in its, in its assessment that in their assessment that they are more vulnerable to it, to those charges than the Republican Party. Right. right? And I just, I, that's sort of been like the, the thing I'm trying to crack is like, mm -hmm. why is that? Um, and was there, you know, I think, I think a lot of people who were involved in the recount, especially on the democratic side, obviously, because they lost, like they, they, they do a lot of looking back and wondering what they could have done differently. Um, I think there's, there's obviously a lot of that, um, in the, in the show, um, just in terms of like specific decisions that people made that maybe they they wish they'd made differently now, but. But I think at the at the very sort of foundation of it is a sort of question about like what's the difference between these two parties and 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 also like how should a party be you know should a, should if should a, if you believe in a party's uh, platform and, and the, you know the ideology that it supports like isn't the moral thing to try to win as you know as ruthlessly as possible um, you know I think I don't think there's any any easy, easy answer there oh for sure. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's a it's a hard choice because, you know, you've got to maintain some kind of 
you know, decorum somewhere. Somebody's got to hold the line, you know, otherwise we'll just fall in the tyranny. But it's like, why, why is it? It's always the ones that like are, are like, well, we're going to restrain ourselves that they, they just don't ever care, seem to catch a break in these situations. You know, it's always five, four the other way somehow. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, gosh, so much to talk about, but the hanging chads. Yeah. I remember that. That was crazy. Like, I, and, and it's funny because you talk about the butterfly ballot. Uh, that's one thing I wanted to get to. And that seems to be the most blatantly, okay, Gore should have definitely won this election regardless. Because a bunch of, like, old, frankly, Jewish people are not voting for Pat Buchanan. I'm sorry. It's not happening. And, he gets, and you said he gets three times as many votes there as any other county around it that didn't yeah, use these yeah, of, yeah. of course yeah, and it's yeah. ridiculous and, and it's not even doesn't even fit like you can't even see where you're supposed to poke i don't blame these people for getting it wrong it, it's like you sh it shouldn't be that complicated you know um yeah but you know on the other hand like there was nothing, anything they could do about it afterwards like true i mean there's no way to reasonably say who did and who didn't you know and there's you know there were like there were people sort of throwing around ideas like oh maybe we can you know, maybe we could do a revote, but like because the constitution says that everyone has to vote on the same day. Like, oh, maybe we can, maybe we can like have a judge apportion the votes like proportionally. It's like, no, that's never going to happen. Like, no judge is going to do that if it's deciding the presidential election. And so the, that's why the Gore team, like as as potent as the as the butterfly ballot was as an issue, kind of had to drop it as a legal issue because there was nothing, just nothing they could do. Um, no. And uh, but I think you're right that like it is the best example or it's like the it's the it's the clearest indication or it's one of the clearest indications let's say that more people went to the voting went to the went to the polls that day intending to vote for gore than bush in florida uh which mm -hmm. is the, which is the line that, that that bush you know excuse me like that gore people often repeat um but uh but it doesn't matter <laughs> You know, like they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't unfuck it up. It was just like, it was like, it was just like a, you know, that's sort of what's, what's I think what I, what I, I, we always try to find like an emotional core and everything and every, you know, sort of story we, 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 we include in the show. Like, I think the emotional core on that is that like some mistakes, man, like you just can't, you can't unmake them. So there's nothing you can do. And that's just like a fact of life. And it's, scary and um you know everyone's sort of used to like getting second chances and i shouldn't say everyone, but like i am you know and 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 the 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 possibility that like something could go wrong and mm -hmm. it's not really your fault but you can't like there's nothing you can do it's just a very sort of sobering you know like it's a very sobering thing to confront and that's what mm -hmm. I, that's what i drew from that butterfly ballad story Right. Um, now, you, you obviously, going back to Catherine Harris, you've talked to at least some of, uh, I assume you tried to talk to Jeb Bush. Did he, did he respond? Jeb Bush? Uh, yeah. So we, we definitely put out calls to, to, to George Bush and, and, and Al Gore. They both, uh, I can't remember if Bush ever responded, but of course people said no. Um, man, you know, I don't, I got to tell you, I don't remember. I think we did. We did. We definitely did put a, put a call into Jeb Bush, but I think we just didn't hear back. Um, it's funny, you know, with, with, with podcasting, like, especially on the schedule where we're going really fast, um, it's, you end up sort of not talking to maybe as many people as you would if, if you were writing individual pieces on all this stuff, you know, like, and so like someone like Jeb, Jeb Bush, you'd think that would be like one of my top priorities. But, you know, part of the reason, part of the reason he wasn't is that we try to tell these stories through, you know, through, through the voices of people who haven't necessarily been as famous as others, you know, and so we'll, sure. of course, we'll include Catherine Harris if we can. But, um, and we'll include a Supreme Court justice, you know, if we can. Um, but, but generally, like, we, we're more interested in, you know, the people who, who are sort of, who are anonymous or who are, who are, whose names just aren't as, as well known. Um, so. Sure. Well, and you begin the season with a familiar story, but I wasn't sure why you were telling it at first. And I was like, okay, all right. So this is like the Elian Gonzalez thing. And then, you know, I'm like, why am I listening to Elian? I, th I actually looked at my phone. I was like, this is that fiasco podcast I meant to listen to, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not the Elian Gonzalez story that I accidentally clicked on somehow. That's that's funny that you thought maybe it was the wrong podcast. Um, 
So yeah, so so Alan Gonzalez was um, a little boy whose mother had brought him to Florida, to the United States from Cuba. Um, she was in a in a boat with I think ten other people, something along those lines. Maybe it wasn't quite ten, but anyway, they they capsized and and everyone. Um, I think everyone died except for Elion. Maybe there was, I can't remember if there was one other survivor. I think there was not. Um, I should know that. But anyway, so Elion, Elion survived. Um, he was clinging to an inner tube and he got discovered by a couple guys who were out uh, in the Atlantic Ocean fishing that morning. Uh, and he became this, this, this incredibly iconic sort of symbol of, uh, well, I don't know. Symbol is probably the wrong word. He was he was a symbol of something. I don't know what he was a symbol of, but basically, he became to he became very important to Cuban Americans in Flo in Florida in my in, in Miami Dade specifically, um, because a lot of those you know most of those people had fled uh, Cuba um, when when Castro took over, and and they were you know extremely anti communist. They were extremely anti Castro. The notion that you know that this boy had made it you know made it across the water. Uh, had barely survived that he was here. Like they felt like the United States owed it to him to keep him to let him stay here. Um, but uh, you know, there there were complications because the little boy's father back in Cuba was like, "No, he's my son, and I didn't consent to him being sent over there in the first place, and I want him back." Um, and so it was this custody battle, and it became this huge diplomatic crisis in between, you know, involving Castro and, and the Clinton administration. And the Clinton administration was sort of like, look, we we have to give him back to his father. Like we, he, he had he had family in in, in Miami Dade who were taking care of him, um, but you know the, the the position of the DOJ and at, at, at uh, INS was that we, we can't we don't, we, we don't have the discretion to keep this boy here. Like he has to go back to his father uh, in Cuba, um, and so that infuriated the Cuban American community in, in Miami, which is a very powerful constituency. Like not only are there a lot of them, um, but they also are extremely, you know, many of them, you know, there's a, there's a very like powerful Cuban American elite in Miami Dade, in Miami Dade County. Um, and, uh, they were very, very, very like furious with the, with the, uh, Clinton administration, particularly after they, after the Clinton administration sent in, you know, armed, uh, armed guys to, 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 to basically pull him out of this house and, and, and put him on a, you know, in a van. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people remember that iconic photograph of him, uh, in the closet while there's a gun in his face. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so so the Clinton administration was sort of being held responsible for this by the by the Cuban Americans in, in Miami and and Al Gore, who was running for president at the time, uh, caught the you know caught the caught the tough end of that of that deal because whereas Clinton himself was not running for re-election, Gore had to you know answer for for the Clinton administration's actions, and he knew that he needed to win Florida or that it would be really 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 helpful for him to win Florida, and he knew that the Cuban American community was. You know, key to getting that, to getting those twenty-five electors, and so he was caught in this very uncomfortable position, um, where he where he didn't quite know what to say. I think about whether Elion should be allowed to stay or go. Mm -hmm. Wait, meanwhile, George Bush just jumped out there, and he just, he, he had a position, right? He was like, "Yeah, I think the boy's father should come over if he wants to be an American." <laughs> or something. Yeah, that was his position, right? <laughs> He should. The boy's father should come, 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 and take a whiff of freedom. Yeah, absolutely. But but that's another thing about Gore is that, you know, kind of. I I, I, I I sent this as a message to my friend Jonathan, who's a, a guest on the podcast often too. Uh, he reminds me. Gore reminds me a lot of Robert Mueller, in 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 demeanor and like just blind trust that the system will work if you just follow the rules and you know like like it's just they they just there's these boy scouts that think that if you just dot all the i's and cross all the t's you can you can win in the end and the system will work and it's like the republicans are like we we use the rule book for kindling and we tip the board over and that's how we win <laughs> you know <laughs> so uh it's just it's just interesting that that you know uh once again it just seems like it's certain is a certain like and it's sad that that's you know a sucker's game uh but it seems to be and that was that was his position on the uh uh military base that was going in the protected everglades mm -hmm. uh too like he was not going to comment because it wasn't time my influence blah 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 
um, right? Yep. Yeah. Right. Had you had you heard about that issue before? You heard? Oh, no, absolutely. It was new to me. News to me. Yeah, it was new to me too. But it seems incredible. Those little things, you know, it doesn't seem important to me because I don't live there, or I, that's not my issue. But yeah. those people turned out to be incredibly important. <laughs> oh, I mean, when you're when you're dealing with the margin, the small. I mean, you were bringing that up earlier. Like, I feel like the fact that the margin was so 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 insanely narrow. Um, makes it so that like you can look back and say any you know any number of these little decisions that were made whether it's on Elion or this Air Force base or any number of other things like that was that was the key like if only they'd done the op- if only they'd, they'd gone the other way on that they could have won they could have had you know this many more votes and they would have won the election uh, and it's almost like a, I, I feel like it's almost like a cheat code um, in a way is, is, is in terms of just like crafting narrative because it like it allows you to kind of in, imbue every little thing with the stakes, right? Because every little thing could have been the the thing that clinched it, right? So sure. And so we sort of we sort of land that land there uh, at the end of the first episode. You know, like we told you these two stories about the about the Air Force Base about Elion, but like, and we do think that they are unique and that they go together in a special way, and they you know tell us all these things about who Gore was as a candidate, but. Uh, at the end of the day, like if you were trying to if you were trying to find if you were trying to find the answer to the question like why was Florida so close and why did Bush you know squeak it out by by this many votes, you could point to so many different things um, about the campaign, but then also about the recount and how it was handled on both sides. So it's it's a it's a it's a convenient sort of uh, it's like a it's like a it's like just turbocharges your narrative when you can when everything feels so high stakes, you know. Right, and I remember. Um... Uh, I was a I was in a band in high school several, uh, and uh, I uh, I used to love Rage Against the Machine and we played a lot of Rage Against the Machine songs and there was a Rage Against the Machine video. Uh, Sing a little Rage Against the Machine because of this because we cause we were looking at uh, Rage Rage yeah. performance outside of uh, the DNC. Sure, like, on absolutely. A little, on a little kick for a while. Definitely. Um, but they had a video. I, I can't remember if it was testify. No, it wasn't testify. It was, it was something off that Battle of Los Angeles album. Anyhow, uh, it was like it was comparing all the ways that Bush and Gore were the same. And you were talking about it being a low stakes election. That was yeah, kind of the yeah, Ralph I Nader. I wish I knew that. I yeah, uh, it's gosh, it's whatever the first single. I'm gonna look it up. But anyway, it's uh, testify. Gor- it? You know, Gor- Gorilla Radio. I think. It was. Radio. That's right. That was the first single. That's right. Yeah, there you go. I remember listening but, to these songs on the radio. For sure. But in the video, they like have this like uh, montage back and forth of them from the debates. Um, and it's like they're saying the same thing. And it's like, there's no difference between these two. And that was the kind of the uh, Ralph Nader line, uh, too. And you interviewed Ralph Nader, and that was, that was super interesting. Yeah. Uh, but like, what do you think of their complicity, first of all? Because... My wife has a funny line about the Green Party is that uh, she, she says that they care more about the environment than any other party, but they've really done more to wreck the environment than anybody because they've helped more Republicans get elected than, than really anybody. So it's like they're really self-defeating in that way. But, they, but they're like, oh, there's no difference between the, these two. Like, what are the, what's the, you know, the same things at the debates, same answers. <laughs> uh, real quick, it looks like the Gorilla Radio video is not on YouTube. I wonder why. Hmm. That's strange. We're gonna have to figure this out later. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I I I I get Nat Nader's argument, which is that like, he's, I mean, his argument in a way is sort of connected to the thing I was just saying, where he's like, look, you lost this election for like a gazillion different reasons. Like, why are you focusing on me as like the guy who tipped it, whereas like all these other things, you know, like, all these other decisions that you made uh, were, you know, were just as just as consequential. Um, I, think it's, I think there's something to that. I think at the end of the day, like, it's hard. It's really hard not to not to look at what happened and say, "Wow, Nader definitely pulled you know some number of hundreds or even thousands of votes from Gore over this fucking Homestead Air Force Base thing." And if he hadn't done that, if he hadn't like made that a part of his pitch and you know hammered Gore on it in Florida, like right before the election, uh, maybe maybe it would have been different and. Yeah, I think I, I I guess like one thing that's surprising about the Nader interview is, I mean he 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 he's he's defiant, you know, like, and I guess I, 
I would have expected it maybe just a little bit more, um, just like a combination of defiance and also like, just like melancholy over it, you know, as opposed to just purely defiance. You know what I mean? Yeah, because surely he would have preferred. Come on, if if you had to ask him for I real, so. I'm sure he would say that Gore would probably have been preferable to Bush yeah. in his estimation. Like like just from his point of view, his worldview, what he wants to have happen. Like so. he, yes, they're very similar. Yes, I see their point in that way. But it's like, come on, when it gets down to it, you got to make a choice. You know, you got to you got to say, look, is this one better? And people always say you're just the lesser of two evils. But sometimes there is a big difference. And I remember, uh, you know, I remember people my parents' age saying, thank goodness that Al Gore didn't win when 9-11 happened. They're like, in retrospect, it's like, what do you think was going to happen? Like, what's, what's the worst case scenario? Gosh, we might not attack the wrong country. Like, we might, you know, like, like what's, what's your, what's your, <laughs> what do you think was going to happen exactly? And, and you mentioned global warming. It's fascinating to think uh, what uh, would have happened, you know, different. Because it seems so mundane at the time, and I I do remember thinking that Gore and Bush were the same, and like Gore, like Bore and Gush or whatever, and mm. you know there was a Saturday Night Live thing about you know the lockbox, uh, Al Gore. He never really lived that down. I think that he he that might have cost him a few votes, frankly. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think part of the thing that the thing that was part of, which was like this idea that he was boring and stiff, and like you wouldn't want to hang out with him or have a beer with him, or that he was like unlikable. I think that was very very powerful, and um, it's uh. It, one thing that this, you know, and one of the reasons we wanted to dedicate an entire episode of the campaign instead of just starting with the recount right away was that I think the, that campaign is super relevant to, you know, at least the Democratic primary that we're in the middle of right now because I think likability is really, you know, something people are thinking about. There's a, you know, there's a debate about whether that's a, you know, a, a, a dimension along which women are are are, are uh, uh, judged more harshly than men or in different or along a different, you know, different standards than men. Um, but like, for sure, you know, likability was, was huge in this election. So it, you kind of wonder like, what's the lesson here is the lesson here that we need to not, we need to not run people who are, you know, unlikable, but good on, on the policies or whatever, or is the lesson that, um, you know, that, that, uh, there's a way to, I don't, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's it, maybe the answer is like, likability is really important. You can't just like ignore it and pretend it doesn't matter. Um, so I think that's one way in which it, you know, sort of resonates with today. Yeah, definitely. Um, how do you feel about, uh, you know, cause you, you ended uh, slow burn with kind of almost a teaser. I felt like for fiasco because you end it with a reference to, what do you, well, I don't remember what you said exactly at the end, but it was something about the, and then the 2000 election happened, and it's like, oh, okay, I see. <laughs> um, yeah. It reminded me of the end of a Marvel movie, you know, when they have that extra scene after the yeah, credits, and then there's somebody else from the other universe that shows up, and it's like, oh, this is how it's connected to the larger. <laughs> yeah. No, it wasn't like that. We had a bunch of different, we had a bunch of different ideas. We were talking about for Slow Burn Three when 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 we were still there, and uh, you know, definitely, I think we we definitely like it brought up. Which we were, I think my, my, my manager was the one who suggested this to me for the first time. Um, we definitely talked about it. We talked about like, you know, 20 other possibilities. And it, it, it was just like a, a natural endpoint for that story because you know, that it was this, it's the story of how the next president was chosen and how Clinton's presidency came to an end. Um, but yeah, no, we didn't, we, we didn't know. We didn't know what we were going to do it at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, interesting that, like, not to keep going back to slow burn, but like, to think back about uh, impeachment uh, then and impeachment now, and people are always like, oh, shouldn't even consider impeachment now because look what happened back then. Clinton just got stronger. But really, Clinton was like paralyzed after that. And partially, I think this this really hurt Gore is that Clinton didn't campaign for him because the advantage of being a vice president, as I understand it, is that you get the power of the presidency behind you at that time and you push them across the finish line and you know what i mean but like he had separated himself from bill clinton uh, a lot and didn't clinton not campaign for him until after the nomination or something i don't uh, like it or you know even beyond that i don't know so um i don't uh i'll totally remember whether there was a i think at the very end like they, they kind of tried to use clinton 
as a last ditch effort. But mm -hmm. for sure, like during most of the campaign, um, Gore wanted to distance himself for Clinton from Clinton because I think he was worried that uh, you know the sort of stink of impeachment and the scandal, the sex scandal, would, would, would sort of cling to him. Um, you know, part of the reason why he chose Lieberman was that Lieberman had been an outspoken critic of, of Clinton on moral grounds. You know, he'd given that big speech that we that we played in Slowburn too. Um, on the Senate floor, uh, condemning Clinton, but not calling for his impeachment, but condemning him in very, very strong terms. I think Gore, you know, chose Lieberman in part because um, it, w it was a way of showing that, like, I'm, I'm a different kind of man. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think you'll find that being like a really big sore point between like Clinton world and Gore world. Like, I think there's a lot of debate about whether Gore made a mistake in in uh, in shutting Clinton out and. Kind of sort of be his own man. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, that's a hard that's a hard uh, sort of question to answer. Like whether whether it would have been mm -hmm. different, but, but for sure it was uh, a, a calculated decision. Definitely. Um, well, hey, I, I know you're a busy guy and you've got a lot to do. You've still got some some work to do, I'm sure. Uh, and so I thank you for for spending so much time. But uh, I did want to ask what music you've been listening to lately. What music I've been listening to? Um, okay, um, let's see. I think I told you this last time we talked. I just have like these playlists on my Apple Music that I just start seasonally. So like, I have um, a playlist just like all the stuff that I that I like want to hear over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. It's on here. Um, Roddy Rich is a rapper. Um, I forget where he's from, but um, he uh, he has a bunch of amazing songs. Um, Every season is really beautiful. Uh, he has a new song called Out the Mud, which is really beautiful. Uh, I listen to a lot of Lil Baby, um, an Atlanta rapper, uh, who has a lot of amazing songs. Um, what else? Uh, I've actually been listening to more guitar music than I have in the past for some reason. I think when I'm whenever I'm make, whenever I'm like in the in in the weeds of making the podcast, like when I'm like scripting and revising and recording and all that stuff, like as opposed to just doing like research and reporting, um, when I'm really locked into it, I, I tend to just not listen to other podcasts at all. I listen to more music, um, and so I've been listening to, to music, particularly like music that I listened to as a much younger person. Uh, like for some reason, I've dug out. Like the Hold Steady, uh, first two albums from the Hold Steady that I loved as a, as a college student. Um, Nirvana has been back in my rotation for whatever reason. Smashing Pumpkins have been back in my rotation. Mm. Um, Juicebox, the guy who, the rapper I wrote my book about, uh, the next mm -hmm. level, um, he has a new album coming out uh, that I've been listening to. Uh, he has a single called Coinstar Song, which is really awesome uh, that everyone should listen to. <laughs> How is Juicebox these days? I think he's great. Um, he's got this new record. Uh, seems like he's thriving. Cool. Awesome, man. Well, keep up the good work. I'm super interested to see what you do next. Uh, can you tell us anything about what you're going to do after this season of Fiasco? What's yeah, next? I, yeah, we, we're, 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 we're doing a round contra as our next thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, just, just so you know, I've had Freeway Ricky Ross and uh, Mark Levin, the director of Freeway Crack in the System, on the show. Right. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm super into the subject already. <laughs> so, we'll do this again when, when some of it's out. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm excited. So cool. Uh, well, uh, thanks a lot for taking the time, and uh, I'll definitely be listening to whatever you do next. So. Well, thanks a lot, Rob. It's really good to talk to you again. Yeah, have a great night. Thank you. Bye.